Welcome to this episode of Intellectual Conservatism. Today, I am here with three uh, Thomist metaphysicians, philosophers. Today, we're going to discuss the Deante argument again. We're going to defend it. So earlier, um, if you've been watching the channel, you saw the debate between Gavin Kerr and Joe Schmid. Well, this is the aftermath. And now we're going to discuss with really three great minds how we can best make the case for the Deante and just evaluating some objections. So I'll just have each of the uh, uh, speakers introduce themselves. Jonathan, how about you go first, then I'll go Christopher and then Paulo. Sure, my name is Jonathan Studi and I live in Minnesota with my wife, Molly, and my son, Michael. He's almost five years old, his birthday's coming up pretty soon. Um, they are currently out of the house so I can actually attend this meeting. So big shout out to them and a thanks to my wife for putting up with me doing all my philosophizing in grad school for the last six years. Um, now, I, I, used to, I used to work as a youth minister, um, did that for a very long time, um, and well, like six years, but you know, that's the longest career I've had so far. Aside from massage therapy, I was a massage therapist for like 11 years, um, but that was kind of part-time and, and sort of like in and out of it, so you know, we're all sore after this. I can give everybody a neck rub or something, but <laughs> I don't know, this is, this is really going off the rails fast. Um, but uh, right I now, I have to go. Holy... <laughs> yeah. I don't blame Sorry, Jonathan, I don't want a back rub. <laughs> all right, let's go to Christopher um, then. But if I, oh, oh right now I'm working, sorry, I'm working at Holy Positive College and Seminary as a professor of philosophy. Um, in my spare time, I practice uh, martial arts and exercise. So, all right, Christopher. Okay, my name is Christopher Apodaca. I am, uh, I live in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Uh, I've taught uh, philosophy at the college level for several years, um, but this year I'm going to be teaching at a high school. I'm going to be teaching math and philosophy at a high school, which is going to be uh, an interesting experience to see how high school students deal with philosophy. Um, and right now I'm currently working on my dissertation on chapter four of Dante, the very thing that we're going over today. So. Awesome. And then Paulo. <laughs> Uh, my name is Paula Juarez. I'm in Indiana. I live with uh, my lovely wife and son. Um, I'm primarily a photographer, but I'm an independent researcher in philosophy. Um, I've written a number of papers, one of which has been published uh, in an international journal. Uh, the paper was called uh, From the Unity of the World to God, a Teleocosmological Argument for God's Existence. Um, Basically, I, I try to find time to uh, work in philosophical projects uh, whenever possible. My interests are uh, metaphysics, philosophy of religion, philosophy of science, uh, and just basically, uh, I guess, the intersection between Thomism and uh, contemporary philosophy. All right. Well, uh, so today we're going to discuss the Deante argument, of course. Paulo, can you begin by introducing us to the argument, its dialectic, and how best to understand it? Sure. Um, so, okay, so um, the argument that we're going to be discussing is sometimes labeled, and this is the term that I'm going to use uh, probably going forward, uh, the existential proof. Uh, also, it's called the Diente argument because it's an argument rooted in a small treatise that Thomas Aquinas wrote called Diente et Essentia, uh, and that means on being in essence. Um, so in this little treatise, uh, Aquinas uh, sets out to uncover kind of the deepest ontological account that you could give of material and non-material reality. Uh, so during the time of Aquinas, there were some schools of thought which held that uh, there are two correlative principles by which to account for the existence of all created reality, uh, and that would be matter and form. Um, according to this view, which came to be known as universal hylomorphism, uh, it's because all things are composed uh, or constituted by matter together with form as the principle that structures or organizes the matter, uh, that things can be said to exist at all. So uh, a number of Aristotelians, the most famous of which being uh, Aquinas, uh, basically affirmed hylomorphism as a theory of ontology, but they denied its universality. And so in other words, Aristotelians like Aquinas affirm that any ontology of the material world has to make reference to a thing's material and formal composition. So that's true enough. But unlike universal hylomorphism, Aquinas denies that this type of composition can be extended to immaterial realities, such as uh, things like souls, intellects, angels, what have you. From all of this, Aquinas concludes that there has to be a deeper ontological account for why all created reality exists. 
And the, this reason has to be found in a more fundamental kind of, this, this kind of distinction, one that encompasses both material and immaterial substances alike. So that distinction is, is, is that between essence, between the essence or the quiddity of a thing and existence or the act of existing of a thing. So central to the argument in the deente or the existential proof is the contention that there is a real metaphysical distinction between the essence of any particular thing and its concrete existence. Uh, put differently, there's a distinction between that by which a thing is the kind of thing that it is, right? And that by which a thing exists in reality uh, and this distinction, unlike the distinction between something like, you know, the morning star and the evening star, uh, picks out two metaphysical principles that have a real as opposed to a merely conceptual basis in reality. So, um, according to Aquinas, all of, the, all of the things of our experience, both immediate and beyond, are what we would call essence and existence composites. And as such, they require a cause of their existence. So the project of the existential proof is to make sense of this puzzle, okay? Given that the things of our experience have the capacity to exist by virtue of being dependent on something else, however can it be that anything at all exists? That's the puzzle. And the answer to this puzzle, Aquinas argues, can only be had if there ultimately is a being that exists in a non-dependent way a being to whom all things owe their existence, a being to whom the essence and the existence distinction cannot, in principle, apply. So this being would have to be such that its very essence is to exist. It would have to possess the fullness of existence. So it could be properly referred to as existence itself or being itself. Uh, this being would have to be immaterial, composite, eternal, everlasting, and unique among uh, other kinds of attributes. Uh, and so in light of all of these considerations, uh, Aquinas would hold that such a being would have to be uh, none other than God. And so that's, that's kind of like the general structure of the argument. All right. Would anybody add anything to what Apollo has said, or is everyone satisfied? Um, did you want to go over the, the, the two arguments for the real distinction or anything like that, or do you want to move from there? Uh, so we can we can move on from there, right? I mean, uh, th that's like a, the part of the argument, right? Um, yeah. If you want to add that, actually, that's fine. So we can talk about the real distinction and unpack that a bit. Yeah, yeah. So the argument kind of comes in three stages. Um, something called the intellectus essentia argument. Uh, the, the second one's too complicated to give a special name to. They just call it stage two argument and the stage three argument. Uh, the first argument, it says, um, if you look at a material essence, a material nature, like a, like a dog or a cat or a lion or a human being, um, our minds can comprehend the, um, the intelligible content of that nature. So I know that a human being or human nature is rational animal, or that I know a dog is, is a feline, is a canine mammal or so on and what forth. But uh, just, just understanding the nature of, the, um, of, the, of a thing, just knowing that a human being is a rational animal or a dog is a canine mammal doesn't tell me whether or not ex those things exist in reality. I can have a perfect understanding of those definitions and be completely ignorant about whether they exist. In fact, I could be wrong about whether they exist. And Aquinas says, well, you can't be wrong about, a, about, you know, about your understanding of a nature if you deny, I mean, you can't be right about your understanding of a nature if you directly deny one of the parts of that nature, right? So, so it means that if I know what a lion is, I have a complete understanding of what a lion is, or, or, or an accurate, even just a partial but accurate understanding of what a lion is, but I deny their existence, I still have a correct understanding of lion nature. So existence can't be part of their nature, right? So existence can't be part of the nature of any material thing. And then the next argument, stage two argument says, well, what if there was a being in which essence and existence were um, identical? How many could there be? What if there was a being in, in whose his nature was just simply existence? His nature is not rational animal or canine mammal or something like that. It's nature just is existence. And because existence isn't self-limiting, we find that there can only be one such of those beings. And there, there, there can't be more than one being in which, uh, which is pure existence itself. And so Thomas goes on from there so to say that, okay, well, is there such a being? And so he argues that since no thing that we find in the world, since none of them has existence as part of its essence, 
um, we're in need of causes here. And he uses the traditional causal proof to get from the beings that are, are, are said to be composites of essence and existence all the way to a being that is subsisting existence itself. And that's the being that he defines as God. So before we continue, like Christopher, what would you say are the central kind of propositions that need to be defended? So obviously one is like the reality of essence sure. and then the, the real distinction, you know, what, what other things would you put in there as, you know, needing to be defended? of the argument. Yeah, yeah. Like, I think that like, um, I think some of the general propositions that we might share in, in common with other philosophers who aren't Thomists that we might not, depending on who you're talking to, things like that being is intelligible. That means we can know all beings in the world. Um, that we know um, that, that, uh, that they're not, you know, they, they function according to rationally discoverable principles, kind of like the same kind of presumption, presumption that you'd make in science, that we know real beings. We don't just know our perceptions or concepts in our mind, but we actually know real beings from where we discover essences, from which we discover essences, that we have the power to discover the essences of things, um, that we can abstractly discover um, intelligible race relationships, like cause and effect relationships. Um, let me see. Um, that we can look at things through two different acts of the mind. One of those acts of the mind is called simple apprehension. And that's where we just discover a thing's nature, right? But what makes us be able to at least conceptually distinguish between essence and existence is that we have a second act of the mind called complex apprehension. And that's the part of the mind that can um, discover judgment. So essence is completely formal. It's all of the qualitative aspects of a being, those things that we can define. But existence adds nothing formal to an essence. Existence is not a, another formal reality that we can define. Existence is, that, is what just makes these formal things real. So we need another act of the mind to grasp something non-formal. And because we have these two acts of the mind, we can at least start with a conceptual distinction between a thing's essence and its existence. And also, let's see here, that we kind of like the principle of proportionate causality, which will be necessary to defend the proposition that, um, that if you have beings in which essence and existence differ, they're ultimately gonna have to be reduced to a cause, which is pure existence itself. Basically, the idea is if you don't possess a property in and of yourself, you know, if, if property doesn't come from your own essence or nature, it has to come from outside somewhere else. And Thomas has already shown, or at least claimed to have shown that Existence is one of those things that we don't belong, that don't belong to us um, inherently. It has to come from somewhere outside of us. So we eventually have to arrive at a cause that doesn't have to borrow existence in a sense from anyone else, but has existence in and of itself. So all of those things are things that are a part of those arguments that we have to either understand or defend or justify at some point when um, debating these. Now, hopefully, hopefully, we're debating with somebody who's a realist, which means most of those things I said about our ability to know the world, our ability to abstract essences from the world, hopefully those are starting points because if we start with an idealist, someone who doesn't know the world at all, it's gonna be really hard to get off the ground with this argument. All right, and to Jonathan, what are some misunderstandings of the argument that should be addressed from the outset? So, you know, some people say, for instance, are you saying that the essences are like floating out there and then they're instantiated or conjoined with reality? Um, and, you know, all sorts of other kind of misnomers that people have about the argument itself. I think that one of the misconceptions or possible misconceptions that should be dealt with right away um, is that, uh, alluding to something Chris said, the arguments that St. Thomas offers, either in defense of God's existence um, or, or to prove God's existence or as uh, the sort of dialectical argument that's in the De Ante at Essentia argument, I think that may be a part of this conversation is supposed to be about the sort of the controversies where the real distinction actually occurs in the, in the arguments. Um, but uh, in, in either case, the, uh, there, there's, a, there's a danger to fall into the trap of thinking that these are sort of a prioristic arguments where we're beginning with certain definitions um, that uh, have uh, some sort of real meaning to our minds um, rather than beginning with reality outside of ourselves, like, like Chris said. Um, St. Thomas's whole, metaphys whole metaphysical system is predicated upon uh, certain realist epistemological intuitions or assumptions, meaning that we have the have as the object of our intellect what we you know as what we actually know and what causes our our, our mind to sort of jumpstart and to start learning things is the real world rather than simply our ideas. And so I think that is a, it's a mistake for us to fall into um, 
the, the, the trap or the, uh, the tendency to make things, make these arguments um, into more like Cartesian or Leibnizian arguments where we have certain definitions like contingency and necessity, um, existence and essence. And these are, these are things that we've contrived in our own minds. And then we're trying now to foist them upon reality rather than recognizing that what St. Thomas is doing is, uh, is first of all, very far down the line in metaphysics. And so this is something that's um, not, uh, not suited for beginners, to be quite honest. I think a lot of people dive into the Dante argument as like one of the first things they explore in Thomism. And it's like, no, you got to go way, way further back than that. You got to start with logic. You got to start with met you got to start with natural philosophy. Um, insofar as you're looking at it from a pedagogical standpoint, uh, metaphysics is, is the, the last of the line. You know, there's a lot of uh, mental conceptions. There's a lot of uh, habits of mind that you have to get to before you can get to metaphysics. Um, but that the main point I'm making here is that we need to make sure that we're, we're recognizing St. Thomas's argument is meant to be uh, uh, within the framework of a, real, of a realist metaphysical schema where our minds come into contact with reality. Um, uh, and it's through the senses that we receive reality first and foremost and the senses convey to the intellect something that the senses themselves don't understand. And it's from that uh, that's that sen sense apprehension, that sense experience, that we begin the process of abstraction of the essence and then return to our sense impressions and make that judgment of the thing existing reality. And so the way that we need to look at uh, St. Thomas metaphysics is first of all beginning in the um, in the real world and it's analysis by our mind and then the terms and the concepts that we give it are the terms that we give it are based on the concepts that we receive from the world kind of teaching us how being operates or teaching us how reality is um, and then the various divisions we make therein. Um, so we need to make sure that we're staying grounded in reality. Um, I think another big issue is like you said, essences for instance for St. Thomas, it's not this like icky ectoplasm that just like slab it all over somebody like like butter that makes it uh, like gives it the slippery character that is you know uh, the reason why you put by the way like in, like boxing or whatever you put Vaselinus when you punch somebody it doesn't cut you um it doesn't hit as hard you too because the friction stops so it's not like it's you know in essence it's a, it's a way of defending nature's i have no idea where, where that analogy is going it really isn't going anywhere the point is the, the essence uh, in a Thomistic point of view is not i don't think terribly controversial and what i mean by that is that in so far if, if you're a realist then you are going to be saying that the, the objects of our experience which are things in the real world really do have some sort of principle of intelligibility in them that whereby we can understand what they are. And for the Thomist, um, this, uh, and, and this is distinct from Aristotle actually, um, for the Thomist, the principle of uh, intelligibility is, is going to be the, the essence considered absolutely. And what that means is it's the essence combined with this general appreciation or general understanding like, yeah, the essence of a cat includes, it's, uh, includes a, a general consideration of cat matter, cat uh, cat flesh and cat bones. Um, and it's not just the uh, concept of uh, felinity, um, but that the, uh, but then recognizing that within the S within that essence, um, it's a, uh, it's a composition of, for material things anyway, it's a composition of the form which perfects and actualizes the matter. Um, and so basically with the Thomistic notion of essence is it's that it's this uh, principle that uh, whereby a thing is what it is, and it includes both the, the formal characteristics, meaning the intrinsic principle of unity, which uh, brings together the parts to operate towards one whole and unified end, um, which is going to be for the good of the, the thing in question. But it's also a general consideration of the matter that's required for that thing to be the kind of thing that it is. So I think that's one, that's another, uh, another big uh, misconception. Can, uh, can I throw something in there, Jonathan? Yeah, go for it. Jonathan, I think part of the, the, the problem that people have is they have a platonic conception of what an essence is. They think that like yeah. a, is like a like cat essence is floating around in the sky somewhere and then somehow you grab a hold of it and become a cat or something like that. Right. Um, but I mean, the, really, the reality of the matter is, and is that Jonathan is an essence. When I say, when I talk about a real essence, it's not something floating around. Jonathan is a human essence. Um, you know, everyone in this chat is a, is a individual real human essence. Or human, human essence, essence, yeah. Nothing more than the organizational unity of the thing, an organizational whole. 
Uh, you take a bunch of parts, they're organized and directed towards each other in such a way as to produce a certain end. In our case, our parts are all organized and directed towards producing the end of human life. And you have an essence. That's what an essence is. There's nothing magical about it. And again, I, like you said, I don't think there's anything controversial about that because we encounter those organizational entities in the world every day. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just... Uh, uh, sure. So good. Go on, Paolo. I mean, there's more, yeah. I think I'm more to say on that, but go ahead. Yeah, well, it's just to piggyback on what you guys are talking about, I just, just to reinforce the point that, you know, the Thomist is not committed to being a Platonist with respect to essences, uh, but uh, rather, as David Oderberg has pointed out, uh, the Thomist is in a way an imminent realist in the sense that what we are committed to is just to the, 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 uh, the position that there are, there are no uninstantiated essences, okay? And so the, the, precisely the distinction in question that we have here uh, between essence and existence is not between metaphysical existence and metaphysical, metaphysical essence, right? But between metaphysical existence and physical essence. Uh, and so I think, I mean, I think, um, I mean, I, yeah, basically just to piggyback on what you guys are, uh, are talking about. Um, yeah. Yeah. And um, also real quick too, um, you know, Jonathan, you were going to make a big point about how, um, you know, uh, you're, you're not coming at this from like an analytic perspective necessarily. And you're, you're a, you're an existential Thomist. And I was wondering if you could, uh, unpack, you know, um, what are the differences between those two schools of Thomism and kind of um, how would they view, would they view the argument differently or would they, you know, structure it differently or interpret things in a, in a, way, a certain way or, you know, unpack that for us? Well, you, you did make me promise to do my best to <laughs> be nice. kind to my Thomistic brethren, but again, I will not <laughs> sacrifice uh, the, the truth on the altar of false ecumenism. Um, <laughs> basically, the differences between existential Thomism and analytic Thomism is that one is Thomism, one is not. Um, just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> kidding, kidding, uh, kidding. Well, well Jonathan um, and I agree that, jo uh, that Joseph Owens is Thomism, right? Yeah, it's jo uh, wait, no, there, there, is, there is but one Thomist, and Joseph Owens is a prophet. Um, that's, that's the confession <laughs> that every existential Thomist has to make. Um, I mean, you know, unless you're, you know, one of those... Uh, it, Fabro, uh, Fabro guys, and you know, in that case, you know, you're got the Italian thing going on too. But um, I don't know what that means. Anyway, so the distinctions between the different schools of Thomism. Um, well, we all like Thomas; he's great. Everybody agrees. Um, and uh, at the the biggest difference is, is to some extent almost like an area of emphasis. And so St. Thomas is obviously Aristotelian in many of the aspects of his philosophy. He borrows extensively from Aristotelian logic. Um, almost verbatim in natural philosophy, um, and even a lot of metaphysical principles. However, um, and, that, and that's kind of the, and so however, the, there's, a, there's a big, the, some, of the, some of the differences are um, within, uh, well, hold on. Nowadays, there's basically three schools of Thomism. There's Aristotelian Thomism, uh, Existential Thomism, and Analytic Thomism. Um, and sometimes there's some like intermixing between the two. And then there's also transcendental Thomism, but we don't talk about them because they, they are okay with Kant. I'm um, just kidding. Transcendental Thomists are cool too. Um, but I'm not as familiar with them, so I'm not going to speak on it too much. But Aristotelian Thomists really like to emphasize the Aristotelian character of St. Thomas's everything. Um, and in fact, if you read um, uh, Preambula Fide by uh, Ralph McInerney, he argues so vehemently for the, um, he, he says he doesn't argue for an identity thesis, which is to say that St. Thomas Aquinas is basically Christian Aristotle and only disagree with Aristotle insofar as Christian revelation um, uh, mandates it, such as the creation ex nihil or the creation of time, um, the, uh, the immateriality and the eternal, uh, or the uh, immortal nature of the soul, that kind of stuff. Um, but they, they will see that uh, for Aquinas and Aristotle, more or less, when it comes to metaphysics, they're, uh, they're, they're totally uh, parallel. Um, what, what's, what Aristotle said in his metaphysics is exactly what, what Aquinas believed. No, uh, no to, to little adaptation or advancement there. Um, I'm summarizing and generalizing quite a bit here. And so they place a very heavy emphasis on the Aristotelian aspects of Thomas, which is great. Um, analytic Thomists uh, will tend to try to bring some of the um, arguments of St. Thomas, but sort of update it uh, with a, um, with a, by introducing it to, and, and trying to, and trying to incorporate certain elements of uh, analytic philosophy. And I think a, a big part of that is like modal, modal logic um, or the 
kind of quantificational uh, method that they have for uh, writing out propositions and making arguments. Um, and I think that there is some merit to that because it, it does give you a really tight way of thinking about certain arguments and clarifying your ideas. Um, but I, I, I think that um, it, it falls short insofar as uh, there are certain aspects of St. Thomas's philosophy which escape entirely mere quantification. And I think that the primary um, instance of this is actually Chris has already alluded to is um, the notion of essay. And this is where the existential Thomists uh, come in to point out that there's been something that's a bit lost in translation since the, the death of St. Thomas. And that's this notion of, of essay. And for St. Thomas, essay, or which means like to be or to being, it's a kind of a progressive infinitive verb, um, is, uh, is something that is unique to Thomas. And it means more than just existence as in like there's an instantiation of it, which is what you'd find in analytic Thomism, or um, that there is that there happens to be such a thing that its form is united to its matter um, as the, the result of some efficient cause, which is what you'd get with Aristotelian Thomism, um, but that there's really a principle in the thing that goes beyond the mere facticity that it exists to a uh, to to a, a real principle of the thing, which gives it an existence that is precisely in proportion to the kind of thing that it is and makes it exist um, over and above the uh, actualization of um, all the principle of its, uh, principles of its essence, even that of form. And that's where one of the biggest distinctions between Aristotelian Thomism, come, uh, Aristotelian Thomism and, and existential to, uh, Thomism comes in is that Aristotle, for Aristotle, he was very clear um, that form is the highest degree of actuality. There's nothing that gets more real or more actual than form. Um, and primarily, you're going to find that in substance. And for Aristotle, substance and, and, and form were the uh, were like the, the archetypical examples of what it means to be an act. Um, but for the existential Thomists, they recognize a, we recognize that in St. Thomas, there's a further um, recognition of uh, or there's a further actuality that that uh, is a is a principle or source of the very actuality, even in form and in matter and essence. And that's going to be called the act of sending, the, the act of a thing's being. And it's distinct, not, in, not just insofar as we can intelligibly recognize that um, we have the definition of a thing versus its instantiation, um, but that it's a, a, a source of reality within the thing itself that is, uh, that is the, the kind of the font of all the other perfections um, that we find in that thing, which is why St. Thomas is wont to say in uh, several of his works that uh, the act of existence is the act of all acts and the perfection of all perfections. And without essay, nothing would be at all and we would find no other perfections of being. And so rather than being sort of this, this static facticity or fairness, um, essay for an existential Thomas, and I would argue for Thomas himself, um, is, this is this dynamic metaphysical impulse that gives things reality. Um, according to the kind of thing that it is. Jonathan, in regard to the difference between analytic and Thomistic philosophers, you know, analytic philosophy begins with, I mean, its whole purpose is to begin with an analysis of language and the terms mm -hmm. and the way that we use them. And, you know, language represents our concepts and concepts are supposed to be likenesses of reality. It seems to me that analytic philosophy tends to start with an analysis of ideas, therefore, a almost a priori sense, and then reason back to reality. Whereas Thomists do the other way around. We try to reason from things that we find in the world and try to get our concepts and terms to match those things in the world. And in regard to the difference between the Aristotelians and the um, existentialists, uh, Aristotle says that metaphysics is a study of being qua being or being as being, not being as, as living, not being as changing, not being as mathematical, but just being as being. But for Aristotle, the most fundamental kind of being, like you said, is as essence. So for Aristotle, metaphysics is a science of being insofar as it has an essence. But for a Thomist is quite different because more fundamental than the essence is its active existence. The essence can't be at all without being conjoined to the active existence, which we've been talking about. So for Thomas, when you say metaphysics is a science of being qua being, we're saying metaphysics is a science of being or things insofar as they have an active existence. And that's a, a major difference again between Aristotelian Thomas and uh, existential Thomas that for Aristotle, um, the uh, a being is a substance. So it's a it's a thing which is, has a particular essence um, that's in reality. But, and so uh, for Aristotle, he is studying real things. He studies existing things, but the, uh, the, the formal nature, the formal object of a science is different, um, where it's going to be things insofar as they are, you know, 
among beings um, and it includes encompasses all beings. It, for Aquinas, the study of metaphysics is the study of beings insofar as they have the act of existence. And so there's a particular angle that St. Thomas is looking at things, um, which is why St. Thomas, uh, um, well, he'll, he'll include all sorts of different things in his, um, in, 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 under the umbrella of metaphysics. Um, famously, of course, it's going to be God and separated substances like angels or human intellects, but also it includes um, individual material, individual things that matter. Um, but it's their individual things that matter with respect to the relationship to their having or not having of essay. And it's also why we can say uh, uh, of, of certain things like concepts that those are also involved in metaphysics because they have an act of existence um, that although it's a, uh, instead of having being a real act of existence, it's a cognitional act of existence. Um, anyway, so yeah, you're right. So the, the, the big difference there is that the, there's the, the, the formal object of metaphysics um, and then the, uh, and also the entryway into metaphysics, but we don't need to get into that because nobody wants to hear my thesis. <laughs> That's okay. Well, then let's just dive uh, more precisely into the argument itself. So I know, Christopher, you already talked a little bit about the real distinction, but just to remind the audience, right, what is the real distinction and, you know, why is the, exist uh, the distinction between essence and existence real? Right. So that, that actually is um, the heart of the argument is, is, is the difference between essence and existence a difference between two real metaphysical principles that must be united to one another, or is the difference merely a conceptual distinction? Because Thomas talks about both. Now, a good example of a conceptual distinction is the difference between an individual, like an individual and its nature. So consider Socrates, for example. Socrates is an individual human being, right? And I can make a distinction between him and his human nature because I, I have to, when I make statements like Socrates is a human being, my mind is separately conceived of those two concepts as predicate and subject. But in reality, there is no difference between a Socrates and his individual human nature because everything that is Socrates is human, right? So Soc the difference between an individual and, and its nature are really just, it's a logical, it's a conceptual distinction, it's a distinction we have make in our minds so that we can write sentences. But in reality, it's not a real distinction. They're, they're one and the same. So it's just a conceptual distinction. But the difference between form and matter that make up a material essence, that's a real distinction. And the way that we know it's a real distinction is because um, for a change to happen, matter has to acquire new forms, right? It has to acquire new forms. So for example, if I burn a tree, it becomes ash. The matter in the tree loses its tree form and takes up a new form, it takes on ash form. And so if the matter and the form were not really distinct from one another, this process would be simply impossible. So form and matter are really different. The question is, which is essence and existence like? Well, one of the objections that people will raise against the arguments that we make, uh, the Dante argument, is that Aristotle himself doesn't believe that essay or the act of existence is a real metaphysical principle. Aristotle thinks that um, essences just exist, things exist in merit of having an essence, right? Uh, I exist because I have the human na nature, I have a human nature. So um, they say that we're begging the question against the Aristotelian argument altogether. But one of the great things that Thomas have pointed out is we can defend these arguments because we can point out that we can um, point out that, okay, maybe the two arguments I gave for the real distinction earlier only give us a conceptual distinction between a thing and its active existence, right? But there's still an act potency relationship there. None of these things have to exist. Their existence is not necessary, right? Maybe there's no such thing as the act of existence, but they don't have to be at all. And so we can use our causal arguments, you know, the, the kind of causal arguments um, of essentially what are causal theories to say that ultimately, if none of the things in the world have to exist, each one has to borrow its being from another or has to be caused to be by another. And ultimately, you get to this being that can't be anything but subsisting existence itself, right? It's not a potential to existence, otherwise it would need a cause. So rather than being potential to existence, or rather than having existence, it just is pure subsisting existence itself. And what that shows to us is that existence is not just a concept, existence is not just a way of looking at things in the world, but existence is a real metaphysical principle in the world because there has to be a cause that is existence itself. And then he creates things and gives them existence, right? But we've already seen earlier that there can't be more than one of these beings. There, there, can't, there, there can't be more than one. So that means that all these beings that he gives existence to can't be pure existence itself. They have to differ from their existence. They have to receive their existence. They have to differ from their existence in the same way that a, 
that a receiver differs from the thing that he's received, you know, the, the way that the, the gift receiver differs from the present that he's given. And so there we get to the point where we find that essence and existence are really different. But the problem is some people will think, some people might think this is incoherent because have you ever found an essence not united to ex existence? No, because without existence, the essence wouldn't be at all, right? And have you ever found existence without an essence? Well, that doesn't make any sense. You have, if you're gonna exist as a contingent being in the world, you have to be something, right? You can't just be existence. Only if you're infinite unlimited existence can you just be existence. So, so um, the response to this is that while essence and existence are really distinct metaphysical principles, they really differ from one another, um, they're not separable. Um, and it doesn't have to be the case that things are separable in order to be distinct. And here's a good example. Consider a circle. It has two different properties. It has a circumference and a radius, right? Now the circumference and the radius are clearly very different things. The circumference is a measure from the center to the outside of the circle, to the, end of the edge of the circle. Whereas the circumference is the measure all the way around the circle. They're two different things, but they're not separable. You can't have a circle without a radius and you can't have a radius without a circle. So they're really distinct, but inseparable. And that's the way essence and existence are. They're really distinct, but they're inseparable in so far as you have a real being. And I like the example that, um, this is kind of a broad analogy, but it helps point us to thinking about something that's extremely abstract because essence and existence are about as abstract as you can get. But John Canassus, a really great um, Thomas philosopher in the tradition of Jason and, and Joseph Owens says, it's kind of like, think about it like this. It's like a donut, right? A donut, requires a hole. You can't have a donut without a hole in the center. If you take away the hole, you have something else besides a donut, right? But the donut and the hole are not identical with one another. The donut is actually made of the, the bread where the hole is, you know, the cutting out of the bread. So you have something that is um, inseparable from something else, but they really differ from something else. And so that's a way to think about it. We're not going to be able to get our minds completely around it today because it's so difficult because existence is just the act of the essence being in reality. It's not its own thing. It's not its own nature. It's the act of the being of the essence in reality. Yet they are really distinct because there can only be one being in which essence and existence are identical. And therefore that which receives existence has to differ from its active existence as that which receives differs from that which is received. It's hard to put our minds around, but it nevertheless is metaphysically necessary. All right, now to Paulo, um, you know, so of course this argument is going to utilize the principle of sufficient reason. So it's going to seek an explanation for the fact that we see, you know, that there is this distinction between essence and existence and, you know, something's essence does not entail its existence, if you will, or, you know, doesn't uh, uh, secure even its own existence, right? It has to borrow that existence from another causal um, source. So the question that I have for you then is first, like, you know, what 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 role does the PSR play in this argument, and just why um, should we accept the PSR? Okay. Um, all right. So let me let me see where to start. So okay. So the principle of sufficient reason, right, um, or the PSR, has different formulations uh, in contemporary philosophy and also in scholastic metaphysics. Uh, and since this conversation is really uh, rooted in, 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 you know, the argument in the De Ente, I'm going to restrict to um, uh, a scholastic formulation of the PSR. So uh, Bernard Wollner uh, defines the PSR as the principle that there is a sufficient reason, sorry, quote, there is a sufficient reason, reason or adequate necessary objective explanation for the being of whatever is and for all attributes of being. Uh, to, put, to put it differently, uh, the PSR basically states that we should seek explanations for uh, any aspect of reality as far as it can be done, uh, precisely because even if reality is not completely intelligible to us, right, it is intelligible in itself. So this is what would be called the moderate rationalist position of somebody like Plato, Aristotle, uh, Aquinas, and even the continental rationalist tradition as well. Um, so. Um, so that's the PSR. How does the PSR, and I'll get to the question of uh, how, how would you defend the PSR, but uh, how does the PSR basically apply to the question of what accounts for uh, the unity of essence and existence composites, right? Um, well, take the fact that the things of our experience are uh, 
metaphysically composite in different ways, right? Uh, they are act and potency composites. They are form and matter composites. Uh, and fundamentally, they are essence and existence composites. So we are warranted in seeking causal explanations for the actualization of potentials, precisely because a potential in the absence of actualization is just uh, an unrealized or unfulfilled capacity. Uh, we're warranted in seeking causal explanations for the unity of form and matter composites, uh, precisely because matter in the absence of some formal principle, right, is, is nothing at all. Uh, and in a, similar, in a similar way, we are warranted in seeking causal explanations for the unity of essence and existence composites, uh, precisely because no essence can exist apart from some concrete individual uh, in which it is instantiated. So in other words, we've already kind of talked about this, uh, given that there are no free floating essences up in Plato's third realm or what have you, uh, there has to be an explanation for their inhering in concrete uh, particular things. Does that, does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, great. All right. So, uh, just kind of quickly, let me try to lay down, I'm going to just kind of give a broad defense of the PSR here. Um, so, uh, just take common experience, right? Common experiences tells us that things just don't really pop into being out of nothing. Okay. Uh, in almost every aspect of our lives, we pretty much operate under the, under the metaphysical intuition that, uh, for any particular event, there is some explanation. So the kettle pot whistling in the kitchen, the traffic jams um, that you encounter in the morning, the, the sound that comes from across the hall, uh, these are all examples that are marked by the same kind of pattern of inference. So in every case, what is uncertain in these situations is not whether there is a, ca a cause to be found, right? But what is the identity of that cause? Uh, so that's kind of a rudimentary defense of the principle of sufficient reason. Um, this principle is not just a presumption of kind of ordinary experience, right? It's not just folk metaphysics or whatever. It's, it's an imperative starting point for philosophy and science, uh, both of which are grounded on this interplay between investigation and discovery. So we, we begin by inquiring into what explains uh, certain states of affairs, usually from the vantage point of what's most readily known and observed by us, and we conclude to something that is lesser known and observed. So one example for this is you can take, uh, you know, the observation of the redshift of galaxies beyond the Milky Way that Hubble discovered, uh, and, 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 and by which he inferred the expansion of space. Uh, so this was by observing the reality, or, or, or another explanation would be, another example would be uh, uh, Aristotle, right? By observing the reality of change, Aristotle arrived at the metaphysical distinction between actuality and potentiality. So both Aristotle doing philosophy and Hubble doing science operated under the belief that reality is intelligible, that there are reasons for why things are so. This is part of what undergirds the principle of sufficient reason. Um, but the, the principle of sufficient reason is not just something that is kind of implicit in the triumphs of, uh, of science in the case of Hubble. Um, it kind of operates in the very nature of disagreement among scientists and philosophers. Uh, scientists who disagree about how humans, for example, arrived on the scene in light of evolution. You know, you've got the gradualists and the punctuated equilibriumists and the panspermians and yada, yada, yada. As well as philosophers who disagree about, for example, the correct account of the mind and body relationship. You've got dualists and materials and emergencists. They all nevertheless agree about one thing, right? And that's that there must be a correct account of things because there is something to be explained. So in other words, there is a fact of the matter about these things. Uh, that would be another argument, basically. The very act of disagreement in science and philosophy is a tendency towards explainable facts. And that's what's guided under the light of PSR, right? Uh, another thing, another quick argument that I would just offer is just, you know, the very history of philosophy, you know? Um, it's, it's kind of difficult not to see the bulk of the history of philosophy as a kind of unfolding of the PSR, the principle of sufficient reason. So Parmenides takes it as given that change and multiplicity just are the sorts of things that are in need of explanation. Socrates presupposes that um, moral character has to be accounted for in some way. Plato takes for granted that certain knowledge or episteme has to be grounded in something. Aristotle refuses to see motion as a kind of brute fact, something that is intrinsically unexplainable. 
Uh, St. Augustine takes it as given that the existence of eternal truths requires some sort of explanation in terms of something that is of like nature. Uh, Al-Hasali assumes that any transition from not being to being requires an actual cause and so on. And so every one of these arguments throughout the whole history of philosophy presuppose or maybe presuppose in some sense that these sorts of events call for an explanation. And so if we are prepared something as fundamental as the reality of the PSR, we should be equally prepared to dismiss the import of philosophical history pretty together, you know, just philosophy, not as a means to reach kind of true conclusions, but just as a matter of just mere opinion, full stop. So that would be a quick defense of the principle of sufficient reason. Let me just end by adding a, a note of skepticism with respect to how the PSR applies to the Deente argument. Uh, and this is not something that I'm completely sold on, but I would say that uh, there are some philosophers and myself sort of included that are skeptical that the, the PSR actually plays any role with respect to the Deente argument. Uh, the analytical Thomist, for example, Barry Miller would emphasize that the important thing about a contingently existing individual and by contingently, he means an essence and existence composite. Uh, the important thing about such a, a, an individual is not that it requires an explanation, right? But rather that any such individual is distinct from its existence. So in other words, what we're dealing with in the case of essence and existence composites uh, is a kind of aporia, okay? And so if you take something like a dog named Fido, Miller writes this, quote, if Fido is distinct from his existence, then it is puzzling how it can be that Fido, Fido exists. For Fido, in himself, seems to have no being whatsoever." Unquote. So the answer to this aporia, as Miller notes, is simply that, quote, Fido has the capacity to exist only qua-dependent on something else, unquote. And so ultimately, Fido has the capacity to exist only qua-dependent on an entity that is not dependent on anything else, and hence it's not really distinct from its existence. And so all of that just to say that, you know, the PSR probably does play a role, but uh, I leave room to the possibility that you could reinterpret the argument uh, 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 for, you know, a causal principle be, uh, be, uh, for essence and existence and composites as a kind of aporia that kind of sidesteps the need of PSR altogether. That's at least an interesting avenue to explore, I think. Yeah, Christopher, what are your thoughts on that? I kind of noticed. Oh, actually, um, Jonathan, did, did you want to add in something real quick? Sure. Give me just real quick. I think that uh, your intuition there, Paulo, is uh, correct in that it might be better to talk about the, as one of the main operating principles within the Dante argument, not the principle of sufficient reason, because that kind of smuggles in certain assumptions or ideas or just like a, a, a general backdrop that we have to kind of understand everything that's going on behind, behind the scenes and it needs to be understood in, in such a way that it's quantifiable and, and, and directly uh, um, capable of being contained within an essential definition and that's not always going to be the case is the case with the, the act of existence or something like that it's something that that's something that is pre-categorical and um, and uh, and uh, goes above and beyond uh, essence um, as uh, as and and being um and so it doesn't fall into the definitions that we can give it through the 10 categories um and so there's something different about the act of existence and about a uh, if, if there is such a thing as uh, a uh, being into essence and existence coincide it's going to be hard for us to really get our heads around that so i don't like the idea of the principle of sufficient reason um more and, and, I, and I tend to favor more like the principle of proportionate uh, causality or the principle of proportion of principality um, insofar as if there is something in the world or something that we discover through reason and we or, or discover through it used to be a encounter through experience that for whatever it is there is a a real principle of why that thing is and why the way and, and why it is the way that it is there's something mm -hmm. even if we can't fully get our minds around it and fully understand it, there's still something intelligible about it in itself, even if we can't get it in ourselves, or if, if we can't understand it according to our mode of, under, mode of understanding. Right, so you're, you're, what you're basically saying is that instead of emphasizing the PSR, what we're really using here is the principle of proportionate causality, and that's the fundamental principle, right, that needs to be defended. 
Uh, Christopher, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I'm, I'm a little I, I would be concerned about using the PSR here too, because the PSR is a logical principle. And Thomas Aquinas makes a huge distinction between logic and metaphysics. Logic is about how our yes. concepts and our minds interact with each other and just and we understand and discursively work, how our, basically an analysis of how our minds work. And the principle of sufficient reason tends to um, towards uh, logical connections and, and a logically necessary being. Whereas um, the principle of causality is a little different. It's, it's, it's not something that we know a priori because Aristotle doesn't think we know anything, or Aquinas and Aristotle don't think we know anything a priori. Rather, it's, um, it's something that we abstract from reality. Um, it, I think the principle of sufficient reason grants too much to um, the modernist metaphysics, the modernist metaphysics of like, uh, not modernist, but modern metaphysics of like Descartes and Hume and Kant, because it's saying we have to prove everything or everything has to be known um, a priori without possibility of doubt. But I think what happens with the principle of causality is we abstract it from our experience of reality. We see that there are potentials. We see that none of the potentials that the potentials can actualize itself. We discover that from that from that um, a posteriori thinking that um, that uh, given nature of what potential is, it can't actualize itself and requires a, a potency and act which eventually gets us to something which is pure act or subsisting existence itself. So uh, I think that it's sometimes a mistake unless we reformulate the PSR to uncritically adopt it um, as our starting point in um, De Ante Descensia. And I just realized too that maybe right. some people in the audience might not understand or know what the principle of proportionate causality is. Does anyone want to define and explain what that principle is? Well, it's, it's basically the idea that whatever is in the effect um, or whatever is in the, the, the patient or the effect has to somehow be in the agent or the cause. So, um, you know, um, wood can only be heated, wood, which is potentially hot, can only be heated by something that is actually hot. Um, now, some people will criticize and say, you know, um, that that doesn't always seem to apply. You know, um, scissors are actually not being cut while the paper is actually being cut. But Part of the principle portion at causality is that the receiver limits the way it gets actuality from the from the giver. So, you know, what is the giver giving the scissors giving to the paper? It's giving motion, which is putting the paper in motion. But given the nature of, of the paper, it's receiving that motion in such a way that it is cut. So even, even in that sense, there's still whatever is in the effect is somehow in the cause. It's basically the idea is you can't get something from nothing, which is not something we necessarily need to prove. It's something that we get from our a posteriori um, analysis and abstraction of reality. It basically is a denial of, of um, this approach is basically a denial of David Hume's epistemology. David Hume says everything needs to be a relation of ideas, which are basically tautologies, or uh, a matter of fact, which are basically just a cataloging of our perceptions. But see, we, we, Thomas, believe that our minds are in contact with reality, not with just our perceptions and our, and our logical thoughts. And so since we are in contact with reality and real beings, we can abstract these principles from our real experience. And, and denying them leads to some crazy things that I don't think are a reasonable, you know, some people who like to play philosophical intellectual games might think this is great, but I think it leads to some ridiculous things that most of us wouldn't be willing to accept, such as the fact that I didn't cut the paper, it just happened, or I, you know, the chair's not really holding me up, I'm just here and the chair happens to be here at the same time, or, you know, my parent, my mother didn't give birth to me, um, there was some birthing incident and then I appeared out of nowhere. I mean, these are things that- There was an incident, <laughs> I have a child now. <laughs> are, the reason why we, we know those are insane is because we believe that our minds are in contact with reality and can abstractly consider the causal relationships that are inherent there. But if you're like human, you think all you know are your perceptions, of course you don't think you can get to causality because one perception doesn't cause another. Hmm. So um, I think I th this is why I think the Thomas perspective is better. We don't need to prove everything from the ground up because we don't ac accept David Hume's epistemology. There, there is a posteriori things that we can uh, abstract from reality that are necessary because our minds are in contact with the real intelligible content of reality. Right. I mean, Sorry, David. basically David Hume is, is a brilliant sophist. I mean, he's, he's just... He's trying to attack the principles of our knowledge by saying, well, maybe we, all we really do know is our perception. But it's like, David, why would you even start there? What, what is your reason for starting there philosophically? Because it makes no sense in the context of our experience. When he also Thank writes you, up judgment and abstraction um, as uh, ways of human knowing, because the way that he understands new, true knowledge is going to be something that's the result of some sort of deductive quasi-mathematical reasoning. Um, and reasoning for the Thomas would be the third act of the mind, 
but for Thomas, but, and, and so I think one of David Hume's biggest problems is that when he approaches um, a, a, our experiences of the world, um, he makes certain hard divisions between the saying sensible qualities and the, the, the hidden, the hidden possible hidden nature behind it, or the notion of causality as a, as a real feature of things, um, because he uh, comes to the table of you know this great banquet of reality that we encounter to feast our minds upon. Yes, you can quote me on that one. Very poetic. Um, he, he comes to the table with certain forks and certain guillotines and kind of divides reality up to with his, uh, with his preconceived notions about what we can already know. Whereas I think the Thomist kind of comes to the table. First of all, you got to cut the circle out on the table so your belly can fit. Um, there is a legend with St. Thomas anyway. Um, and you just kind of like feast on the, the experience that you have and, and, and derive from that uh, the notions that you start uh, the, no, the notions by which you divide reality. And so you, you come to reality, accept it. And then as you're learning more about reality and recognizing the distinctions between different things and different aspects and, of, of these things, um, you, you start uh, developing certain terms and axioms that are true for all beings. Whereas David Hume approaches the table uh, with a lot of his, um, a lot of his metaphysics and a lot of his uh, uh, epistemology already well in place without having justified them in fact they're just uh, they're just assumed um, rather than argue for I think anyway all right well so I was going to move on to talk about um, causal finitism with Paulo but um, do we st is it still relevant to mention causal finitism or you know do, is that an essential part of the argument or do you think we could move on to actually just getting at um, the being in question or the, the ultimate source of reality for Th for St. Thomas. What do you mean by causal finitism? Probably so for instance, for like, um, cause. yeah, so you need to like have a first cause. You can't just have an infinite regress. Oh, oh. So we'll probably, okay. we'll probably have to talk about the distinction between per accidents and per se causal sure. series. And so that's, that's, that's one species of what I think you mean by causal finitism is one. Um, yeah. Do you want me to dive into that? Yeah, sure. Paula, go ahead. Okay, so um, I'm going to, so just real quick again, the, uh, so causal finitism is kind of a modern uh, uh, term that sort of entails uh, uh, the uh, per accidents versus uh, per se causal distinction uh, in a way, uh, but not completely. So um, I'm going to um, uh, employ some contemporary arguments in support of the, uh, the conclusion that we want to arrive at uh, uh, with respect to the DNT argument. Uh, and I hope my uh, Thomist friends won't think of me too much of a heretic. But uh, <laughs> uh, so one reason to accept um, that, or let me just start here actually. So, so we've, we've talked about uh, the real distinction and how in the world there are things that are essence and existence composites, right? Um, part of what I take is going to be uh, necessary for the argument to go through is, is, uh, talk about uh, infinite regresses, right? And whether and whether there can be a causal regress such that it can be terminated in something that is not an essence and existence composite. Okay. So with that kind of preface, let me talk a little bit about uh, the thesis of causal finitism, which is something that's been developed in recent years by Alexander Proust and other contemporary philosophers. So according to causal finitism, the idea is this, quoting Proust, uh, it's impossible for a single output to have an infinite causal history, unquote. So the thesis is, this thesis is basically arrived at by considering a number of so-called paradoxes of infinity, uh, basically thought experiments involving an infinite series of tasks or events, all of which uh, would seem to lead to absurdities. Uh, and the argument of causal finitism is basically that the most coherent and plausible way to resolve all of these different paradoxes, Hilbert's hotel, what have you, is to conclude that there can't be infinitely many causes behind an effect. Okay. So what I want to say is this, if causal finitism is true, then it would follow that my causal history as an essence and existence composite as well as the causal history of any essence and existence composite would have to be finite. But then whatever is ultimately responsible for my existence as an essence and existence composite uh, could not itself be so composed because 
if it were, then it would also require a cause of its existence beyond itself. And so the causal series would not actually be finite. Uh, the only, in other words, the only way for my causal history to be finite would be by recourse to some fundamental cause in which essence and existence are not distinct or identical. So in other words, something whose essence is to exist. So that would be one example of a contemporary argument applied to the, to the day entry argument. But uh, a second response, response one, which, one which is going to be more faithful to Aquinas' formulation of the existential proof, is to distinguish, like I alluded to before, between two causal series. So that's causal series that are accidentally ordered and causal series that are essentially ordered. Um, an accidentally ordered causal series is one in which the later members in the series are dependent upon the early ones for their causality, but only in some initial sense, right? As for example, when a, when a son is begotten by his father, who is in turn begotten, begotten by his father and so on. Uh, in that example, once the son exists, he can go on to exercise the causality of getting a son of his own independently of the causality of his father, right? In, in fact, the son can go on to beget a son of his own long after his own father is gone. So contrast that kind of series, which again is an accidentally ordered causal series with an essentially ordered causal series, which is one in which the later members are simultaneously or um, concurrently dependent upon the earlier members for their causality, as in the case of a rock that is being pushed by a stick, which is being moved by a hand, which is being moved by the mind, where the motion of the rock is simul simultaneously, right, or concurrently dependent. Um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. Uh, it's, it's, it's all simultaneously dependent and ultimately dependent upon the causality of the mind. So, uh, cons Note that in such a series, the intended effect, which is basically that of the rock being moved, cannot be sustained in the absence of any of the earlier members, right? You need all the members for that to happen. So for Aquinas, it's in principle possible that you could have an, an accidentally ordered series of causes uh, that is infinite in any direction. Uh, and that's precisely because within such a series, every member, once it exists, will continue to operate or can continue to operate independently of the earlier members. So you can imagine a scenario in which you have our universe, right? And our universe came into existence uh, from another universe and you can go on and on to infinity. So for Aquinas, such a series could in principle be infinite in both directions because it would constitute an instance of an, inst of an accidentally ordered causal series. So that would be one in which every member can carry on independently of any prior members. But now, things are a little bit different when it comes to essentially ordered causal series, uh, whereby every member is simultaneously dependent upon the earlier members for the exercise of their causality. Uh, in, in, a, in an essentially ordered causal series, every member owes its causal efficacy to the prior members at all times. And this entails that each member has its causal powers uh, only in a kind of derivative or borrowed sense. But this gives rise to a problem, right? How, how is it possible for any member within an essentially ordered causal series to exercise causal powers uh, if its ability to do so is only purely derivative or completely dependent on the causal activity of prior members? And that would be members whose causal powers are also derivative, right? So that's the puzzle. The answer to this puzzle um, is hidden in our example of the rock that we talked about. The rock which is directly moved by the stick, which is directly moved by the hand, which is ultimately moved by the, man, by the mind. Uh, and just to preface, I say ultimately moved by the mind in a kind of loose sense, and you'll see why in a minute. Um, as Aquinas argues, no essentially ordered series could be causally efficacious unless the series would terminate in some limit, right? In some fundamental cause, that is responsible for the causality of every member within the series, something that can cause and sustain the causality uh, of the entire series in an independent or non-derivative sense. So for Aquinas, any effect within, an, within a, an essentially ordered causal series has to ultimately be traced back to some cause, uh, which is the origin or the source of the effect as manifested throughout the series, and without which the series would be completely unintelligible. Okay, 
wrapping up. <laughs> so what is the relevance then of this distinction, right? We've drawn this distinction between a causal series that is ordered accidentally and one that is ordered essentially. What is the relevance of all of that to the existential proof? And the relevance is this. Uh, consider that by virtue of being an essence and existence composite, right? My existence is distinct from my essence uh, as a rational animal. Uh, my existence doesn't follow from my essence, okay? My existence cannot be self-imparted to my essence. Uh, these things are true, not just before I exist and then at the moment of my conception. It's also true once I come into being and it's true at every moment at which I am alive. Okay, so in other words, because it is not here and now of my essence to exist, um, there has to be here and now some cause or series of causes that are responsible for my existing, again, here and now. Uh, but note that this is true, not, not just for me, right? But it's true for every, any, exist, any essence and existence composite, right? Uh, for any essence and existence composite, it is also going to be the case that it too will depend on an outside cause for its concrete and immediate existence. And so whatever causes the existence of any particular essence and existence composite has to inevitably form, will inevitably form a part in some larger, essentially ordered causal chain, uh, which as we've seen is a consequence of any essentially ordered causal chain, that it has to terminate in something that is responsible for the causality of every member within that series, something that is the origin or source of the effect as manifested throughout that entire series and without which the series would just be completely unintelligible. And so in short, uh, the existence of any essence and existence composite here and now entails uh, because, let me backtrack, backtrack. Uh, any essence and existence composite is going to be part of a larger causal chain that is ordered essentially, that is going to be essentially ordered. Um, and so the existence of any essence and existence composite here and now is going to entail the existence of a cause that could not possibly be an essence and existence composite, but has to be something in which essence and existence are identical. And so Aquinas spends several pages, not just in the De Ende, in the De Ente, uh, but it also in the Summa Theologiae, the uh, Summa Contra Gentiles, uh, his Compendium of Theology, uh, he spends multiple pages basically outlining why it is the case that such a cause would have to be God. And so that's, 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 that's the relevance of causal finitism to the, uh, uh, the argument that we're discussing. All right. And before we get into objections, I, ju I just now want to have Jonathan explain how do we know that the the uh, the the ultimate source of being, the ultimate source of uh, the essence, existence, unity, right, is God Himself. Well, how do we know that this being is God? Sure, and I'll give a relatively brief answer, which I'm sure will come as a reprieve to our many listeners. Um, I'm not sure how many people you get actually. Uh, so basically, so early, remember how I said that. Um, so that, this is one of the big difficulties that I think a lot of people have with theistic arguments in general is that you get to the end of the, like, the Kalam cos cosmological argument and you say, all right, great, there's a cause for the Big Bang. But what? Um, and I mean, Craig has uh, some interesting arguments, you know, it has to be timeless, baseless, uh, unimaginably powerful, and so on and so forth. Um, but in, in a sense, those seem almost contrived um, or almost like begging the question against the possibility of it being a uh, of it being a multi multiverse scenario or whatever, um, and it gets really complicated really fast. And in the order to even understand it, you have to have these wildly advanced degrees in, um, uh, in like quantum cosmology and all that junk. But St. Thomas's arguments, on the other hand, because they're metaphysical, uh, they are accessible to anybody who can spend the time reflecting on reality in the in, in the right way, especially on the act of existence. Now remember, um, if we uh, look at St. Thomas's five ways, the, uh, when he when he uh, lays them out in the Summa, he starts off by uh, saying the objections, then he has this thing on the uh, this thing, uh, a section in his, his Disputatio called the uh, on the contrary. Um, and for the on contrary, for the on the contrary, he always cites uh, some authority or or something along those lines that's going to be agreed upon by um, both objectors uh, both uh, uh, participants in the argument. And for the five ways, he says, uh, on the contrary, 
or as it's written in Exodus 3.14, I am who I am. And so the very God that St. Thomas Aquinas is trying to demonstrate is the God of Exodus 3.14. And that's the, the, the God whose very nature, very name is to be. Um, and when we couple that reality or that idea with the notion that we talked about earlier, which is something St. Thomas discovers earlier in his metaphysics, that the act of existence is the perfection of all perfections. When we get to something um, in whom essence and existence are uh, are indistinct or that they're identical in him and it's he his his very nature is to be the endless endless and perfect uh, unbound unconstrained act of being then what we get is a god or a being um, who has all the perfections in every genus and this is why uh, we would call him simply perfect because there's nothing, there's no perfection of, of, of being that's, uh, that's in creatures that is lacking in God. Um, and the way that we have to understand this is, um, first of all, through negation. Um, and, the, and what that means is that whatever we predicate of God, we have to sort of keep in the back of our mind that it's going to be different than the way that we find it in creatures. Because the way that we know perfections in things um, uh, of our experience um, is by it being you know, having some degree of limitation or some uh, some determination to it. You know, an, an oak tree is only lives so long. It only has so much power. Um, it, it only has so much. Uh, it only has such a, uh, a particular range of goodness that it's oriented towards. And same thing with men and cats and um, and birds and and everything else. You know, you get you get certain things like a rock, which just kind of sits there and, and bees heavy. Um, or, uh, but you can jump up to the level of life where you have cats who also sit there and be heavy, but they also knock your glass off the table um, and stare at you with contempt and possible probable murder in their hearts. Um, or as, as dogs have some other perfections and so do, so do humans um, when it comes to uh, their ability to, to sense, ability to reason, um, ability to know and to love and all that kind of stuff. All the perfections of being, all the different actualities we find in creation do have their have a set limit and but they wouldn't have that limit if they didn't exist at all um, and so what again St. Thomas concludes from that is that the act of existence is the fundamental act by which anything has any other perfections whatsoever so when he finds something whose very nature is in an unlimited act of existence we find all the perfections of being in that thing um, but in one act so it has to be one act but it, and it's found in it in a different way because Whereas we find perfections in creatures in a limited manner, however those, however those uh, ex those those uh, perfections exist in God will exist in an unlimited manner, which leads us to I think a another principle in Saint Thomas's uh, reasoning or his understanding of um, uh, how we predicate certain ter terms of God or um, attribute certain things of God is the doctrine of analogy. Now, oftentimes we think of analogy as a sort of like a logical doctrine where it's like you have thing one thing two and thing three and thing one and thing two are kind of like each other because of this and think one and thing two are kind of like thing three because of because of this um, and they're not always connected um, in terms of their, their metaphysical content so like we could say that in, in a, and there's, there's various kinds of, uh, of um, analogy here um, for instance, we have uh, the, the analogy that we, we would have like where a cat and a dog are similar to each other in so far as both animals. And so there's, um, what's that called? An analogy of, of, of uh, improper proportionality or proper proportionality there. Um, or an ex uh, and then we have the analogy between like the heat of a fire and the heat of the pan um, that in, in which the, uh, the, the, the fire is causing. Um, and this is the kind of analogy that uh, St. Thomas has in mind when he's talking about um, when he's talking about the analogy between the creatures that we encounter our experience, the perfections they have, and the analogy uh, and the and how those uh, perfections also subsist in God um, or are to be found in God. And what this means is that when we're looking at this uh, analogy of, pro of uh, proper proportionality, we recognize that there are certain perfections of being which are common to all being, which, have, which imply no imperfection whatsoever, kind of like being material or limited, um, so on and so forth. Um, and this would include things like uh, goodness, uh, uh, intelligibility, um, 
uh, beauty for some people, unity, um, and on a second level, you could also say like things like intelligence and life or, or um, volitional, uh, like having a volitional nature um, are also uh, going to be present in God, but in a way that is uh, to say that it's, it's truly there in God, but it's subsisting God in a way that's different than what we're going to find in creatures. And, there's, or, and I think there's a particular order there that's, that's appropriate, is that we, we can say of God because he is the cause of all the perfections that we find in things because of the, uh, the, uh, the principle of proportionate causality, that whatever we find in the effects are going to be found and necessarily exist somehow in the cause. Um, but the way that they exist in God and, and creatures differs because of the limited nature of creatures and the unlimited nature of God. And so when we talk about analogy in this sense, and that's I think the truest, most metaphysical sense, what we have is we have God as the, the source and the, 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 the principle of all perfections whatsoever. Um, and all other things are, are, are vague and limited imitations of that absolute perfection that is God. And the way that we get there isn't from, uh, is, is by reasoning from the limited things that we find in our experience and the perfections that we find in them to God as the, uh, to, uh, to God as the first principle of all those perfections. And so we see this perfection of existence um, subsisting both in God, but in an infinite manner, but also in creatures in a finite manner. And so when we talk about something which has all perfections of being whatsoever, lacking nothing and being perfectly good and happy within itself um, and, and having existence at its very essence uh, and uh, containing within it all the perfections that we find in all the various genuses, I can't think of anything what that would be besides God. Hmm. Um, so we examine God through, first of all, recognizing that whatever God is, we're, uh, whatever, uh, whatever God is, we're not it. Um, and then secondly, we recognize that because there are certain perfections in creatures and God is the cause of the thing of the perfections that we find in creatures, those perfections must somehow exist in God, albeit in a different manner. But the, the general meaning of that perfection remains the same, even if the specific content of that perfection changes according to the uh, kind of thing in which that perfection subsists in the same way that you'd have a, uh, like I said before, the, the, the fire heats the uh, pan on the stove, there truly is fire, uh, there's truly as heat in the pan, but that uh, pan has heat in, in a received manner, in a participative, uh, participative manner, whereas the fire has it essentially. And so the perfections that we find in created beings are had accidentally actually, um, and um, as uh, caused in them, whereas God has those perfections, whether it be goodness, truth, uh, intelligibility, oneness, unity, um, uh, in intelligence, and so on and so forth. He has those things in an essential manner, all in one uh, one absolute act of existence. And so from that, we can say that, yeah, this, this thing would have to be God, even if we can't fully get our mind around it and doesn't fit our anthropomorphic uh, uh, tendencies to uh, think of God as like a super, super, mm -hmm. super, super Zeus. Yeah, Christopher, to, it looks like you want to hop in. Yeah, I just want to say you have to be careful with this, though, because some perfections are proper to the specific limitations of the nature of a limited being. So, for example, sure. the perfection of having sharp teeth is proper to the limitations inherent to being a wolf. So God, uh, because they are proper to limitations, we wouldn't say that God has teeth. Right. Um, having teeth is some very imperfect way of, of, of imitating God. But the perfections that we would be able to analogically um, predicate of God and creatures would be those perfections that aren't inherently tied to limitations in, in, in the natures of limited beings. So for example, goodness is not inherently tied to being uh, limited to limited beings, so it could be true of God. Uh, being intelligent is not something, having an intellect is not something that is necessarily tied to being a limited being. So God could be, we could say that God is intelligent. Um, but being, you know, having a lot of muscles, which is a perfection of a, of a weight builder, a weightlifter, is inherently tied to, yeah, sure, Jonathan, uh, is inherently <laughs> tied to, um, is inherently tied to um, the limitations of being a weightlifter. And so we wouldn't predicate that of God. Um, Weightlifting would be, uh, having muscles would be a very imperfect imitation of God, less perfect than something like intelligence, which would actually be analogically predicated to God and creatures. Right, we could say that with, with muscles, there is a certain amount of power that's there, and since right. power is the not power, something that, yeah. Yeah, the muscles is having power. The power is present in both God and creatures analogically. Mm. Nice save, Jonathan.
Um, and then also just to, to back up a little bit too, real quick, before we get into objections, um, some people want to, uh, or you, one might want to emphasize the fact too, like some people might be wondering, well, like how do these things, um, you know, like for, exa- for instance, with the principle of proportion and causality, right, in order to give uh, a perfection, you have to first have it. Some people might wonder, well, how, like, how did the essences pre-exist in God? Or, you know, for instance, uh, some people will p- uh, posit divine conceptualism and so forth. Or they'll talk about how they pre-existed in God eminently, not virtually or formally. Does anyone want to kind of unpack um, that notion of how these, um, you know, beings pre-existed in God? Well, I mean, in one sense, if we're talking about uh, the imitation aspect of that, every God is subsisting existence. So he's the fullness of the actuality of being. Every essence or nature is just a limitation on being. So it's, it's, it's God is taking being and putting like a little uh, gate around it that makes um, dogs. And he's putting another gate around being and that makes humans. And he's putting another gate around, um, uh, you know, uh, rocks and that makes rocks. I'm, I'm being super literal here, but um the idea is that um, is that they, they pre-exist in God insofar as all of these things are being, and being is just, a, and, uh, and therefore um, anything that is being is, is an imitation of God. But it's not like God is, his mind is cut up into multiple, like there's not a part of God that is dogness and a part of God that is humanness and a part of, no, he's an infinite, simple act of perfection of being. And then when he creates beings, he's, he's creating limited acts of being by drawing little fences around them that create these different kinds of things. Right, and that's precisely one of the points that we what we have in um, the, uh, the Dante reasoning um, is that essence is that principle by which existence is, um, uh, an act of existence is limited and it's limited to a particular range of going about doing things in reality. Um, and so a dog will always do dog things That's because it's, its way of existing is always constrained by its dog nature, its dog essence, and the same thing with cat or rock or, or whatever it might be. And so just like Chris uh, said, I, I, I like to think exactly in the same way you, you do, is that like existence considered precisely in itself is a like unlimited uh, range of, like it's like an unlimited field, like there's always more field. And the only way that you can divide or like make a fence um, and something that's okay. Now I'm, I'm seeing where Chris is like maybe looking at me, thinking I'm going to panentheism here. I'm not. No, no I don't. I don't. Um, I don't. Oh, okay, good. Um, it's like you have this like well, unlimited field. Like existence itself is this unlimited field. Um, and in order to establish a boundary between your ho- your your yard and your neighbor's yard, you can't just add more field to it because there's already infinite field. There's no more field to add. Um, and so in the same way, God, there's no more perfection to add to God. So he has he has all of it. Um, and he, he is perfection because he is the act of existence in, in itself. But when it comes to the individual limited things, what it is, we, we add something from the outside. Well, what's outside of being? Well, nothingness. And so this is where the, uh, what, what, there was a, a, con- a controversy like in the like, late, mid 20th century about like the, the thick essence and, or thin essence understanding of, uh, you know, of how, how we should look at essences. Um, and for the Thomists, we would say, or at least ex- existential Thomists, we would say that there's a very thin essence and that the thin essence, it's a real thing. It's, or, sorry, it's a real principle. Yeah. Um, of, of the thing, but it's precisely just the limitation of the thing's acts of existence to being uh, confined within a certain range. All right, perfect. So let, now let's get into some objections to the argument. So I think I'm going to break these down into just like kind of three objections. And if you have more, then we can talk about them as well. But one is that I've heard about uh, the the objection from existential inertia that often comes up and mm-hmm. um, that would be worth talking about. There's also um, Opie's objection, and if I remember it properly, Opie's objection is basically like existence is not a predicate, right? So um, if, that's, if that's, and then the third one is just that generally speaking, uh, I've heard, I remember um, when Stephen Nimesh presented the De Ante argument to Ryan Mullins on their debate on cra- capturing Christianity, Mullins just said, well, look, the God that you're positing is just unintelligible. So it's not even really getting us to God in the first place. So maybe we can talk about whether or not classical theism is coherent and whether or not this conception of God actually makes sense and so forth. So, I mean, let's just start off with existential inertia. Okay, that's fine. Um, <laughs> well, I think that there's uh, one, of the, one of the big problems with existential inertia is like uh, the, the analogy itself is flawed in a couple of different ways. Um, and let me see here, how do I want to order this? I have ADHD, 
it's the end of the day. So too, my so mind is actually wild. are out of luck. I think that our audience is already probably tuned out by now. So because <laughs> you know, they're, they're better, uh, that they know better. Um, but I'm trying to figure out how I want to order this. So I think the first problem with existential inertia is it doesn't really appreciate the um, to mystic insight into existence. And this is something that's absolutely unique to St. Thomas. For him, nobody understood existence, so the act of existence as, a, as, a, as, a, as an act um, that is distinct from essence and that, is, that uh, to which essence stands as potency. Um, and throughout the, the life of a thing, um, whether it be a tree, uh, a human being, or whatever it might be, um, the, the perf it, it's always growing in perfection. It's always, it's always on its way to some other perfection and are all on its way to some further act of existence. And so um, to think of existence as sort of like an inertial quality, I think gets the, gets the understanding of essay wrong. Um, and this is because inertia would be like, you know, let's say you're in a vacuum um, and you throw a ball or whatever, this is the fact of like, uh, um, physical inertia. And I'm even leaving aside that physical inertia is just an abstraction you'll never find in the real world. Um, but the, uh, uh, but it's, it's the acceleration of a ball to like 60 miles per hour. And in the vacuum, it's going to, it achieves that, that velocity of 60 miles per hour and given no outside influences, um, it's going to re remain at, at 60 miles per hour. Okay, great. It's kind of entered into the fact that it's traveling 60 miles per hour, but that's not how uh, essay actually functions in things. Um, because every new moment, every new uh, quality that thing takes on is just a, a, a further progress or further, uh, is a change in the act of existence um, in, a, in a more fundamental way. And so there's this acceleration and deceleration uh, that's going on. And so I think that the, uh, the analogy is wrong. I and mean, a better analogy would be like the accelerate that, uh, that uh, essay, the, the, the imparting of essay to a finite thing is more like a ball accelerating from zero to 60 miles per hour or whatever it might be. And so there's this constant input. And the second that the pitcher lets go of the ball, the accelerating stops. And now this, the, the difference here is, remember this is just a, an analogy, like a pedagogical metaphor. Um, the difference here is that in the ball, the ball already has all of its own perfections, all of its, and it has an active existence, all of its own that's distinct from the picture itself. And there's this sort of material receptivity to motion that the ball already has before the ball, before the pitcher picks it up to even throw it. However, when it comes to the active existence, um, there, if it's not for the active existence being imparted to the, to the, the, the finite creature, um, there is nothing about that creature that can continue to receive or continue to kind of like maintain even a partial, not even even a piece of existence um, throughout the, uh, or a after the, the cause of its existence has ceased to operate upon it. Um, in the same way that the, uh, the, the hand of the picture, um, once the hand of the picture ceases to operate on the ball, the ball will cease to accelerate in the same way. Once the uh, hand of God ceases to operate in a finite thing, um, by granting it existence, that thing will cease to exist, period, because on its own, it is nothing, because without God, it is nothing. Um, it would, without God giving it the constant influx of existential, uh, existential reality and a limiting principle of existence. I also think that it, it, the analogy is based on a misconceived notion of how existence can be a property of a thing. Yes. Um, because it treats existence as like a, something that the thing can have in and of itself, which we've already seen is problematic. A Thomas can argue against the existence being in thing. If it has existential inertia, then it has the principles of its own existence. But if it has the principles of its own existence, then it's self-caused and it's an act in potency at the same way at the same time, which is completely, um, you know, that's, that's self-refuted or that's a contradiction. So, you know, existence is not just a, a thing in the essence or, you know, existence is a thing posterior, prior to, the essence itself. It's something that the essence is dependent upon, which means the essence is in potency to the act of existence and the potency and act always require a cause to, to actualize them. Um, the other problem too is that if we treat, treat existential inertia in the way this argument does, it makes existential inertia a property of things. Again, a property of things. But if you have a property, then you now have a composite. You have the, you have the substance plus the property of existing. 
And if you have a composite, metaphysically, that raises the question of why are these two things composite? Do they have the potential for, to be not co so composed? Yes, they do. They also have the potential to be composed, which raises the question, if the thing is composed with this property, then it needs a cause to explain why those th two things are so composed. But if it requires a cause to explain why the two things are so composed, then it doesn't really have existential inertia. Yeah, and just to add to that, um, just to, I just want to reemphasize the point that um, it is true of every essence and existence composite that it is not of their essence to exist here and now and at any moment at which they exist. Uh, and so, uh, I mean, I think that in itself sort of addresses the issue of existential inertia because there's just no room um, for, for, for any essence and existence composite to subsist in a way that is, uh, um, that is intrinsic to itself, as you, if you will. It's that intellectus essentiae argument that a thing can be known without right, yeah. active existence, which means that existence is not part of its essence, which means it doesn't have a principle of its own being in and of itself. Uh, whether you've made this distinction real logical at this point in the argument is irrelevant. It, it doesn't right, exist yeah. in and of itself. And therefore, um, it's impossible for it to have this existential inertia. And I think it all comes down to that. You have to understand or conceive of existence as a principle upon which the whole thing depends, um, not as just another property that sits inside the essence, which is impossible. Right, and I think that if we posit the idea of existential inertia as being some sort of change to the essence itself, um, as in it's a, it's a principle that, you know, once a thing is brought into existence, the essence can kind of go on doing its thing, even without the, the cause that brought into it existence. Um, one, again, uh, assumes that the essence has some sort of reality on its own apart from existence, which is absurd. Um, and then secondly, that the essence uh, what will actually undergo sort of like to, to use an uh, use an analytic philosophy against itself, it would, it would, uh, it would constitute like a, I think what a, a change in a rigid, a rigid quantifier for what the thing is, because if a thing is contingent by its nature, then it cannot become thereby become necessarily existent um, by having this existential inertia until destroyed by something or um, by having certain conditions for its existence removed or whatever. It might rigid be. designator is that what you're talking about? Yeah, uh, we're, we're a thing like it, it's, yeah. it's going to be this in all in all in all possible worlds in all possible worlds. Uh, uh, my cat Elmo, uh, my three legged cat Elmo, I might add, uh, is is going to be a contingent thing. And there's nothing that and adding something to him like the active existence as an essential feature of uh, what he what he is because anything because whatever you find in the thing, whatever perfection you find in the thing, either comes from the principles of, of its essence or from without it. Or, or from uh, uh, from something else outside of it is, is caused in it, um, and since the principles of uh, Elmo's essence um, are such that they don't include the active existence, then the active existence must always be something that is added to uh, Elmo, even if he happens, even if it happens to be the case that Elmo exists. Which again, where I think the the failure on the uh, not the failure, but the, the the shortcoming or the inadequacy of understanding existence as a um, as a categorical predicate um, and as a uh, as something that we just recognize as um, a, a fact of the matter uh, fails to appreciate the actualizing nature or the or, or existence as a principle of things by which they exist. Um, and so in any case, we're, what we're going to be having in the notion of existential inertia is a, is a change in the definition of what the thing is um, according to its essential properties. Because in one moment, before it exists, it doesn't necessarily exist and is contingent. And then in the next moment, it exists and it necessarily exists as a part of its essence, unless it's destroyed by something. Um, and that's a change and sort of be a contradiction with the way that you're analyzing the nature. All right, good. So now moving on to Opie's objection. So I'm trying, um, I, I think Opie, either he's published a paper on the, uh, on the Dante argument or he's in the process of getting that approved and published. So um, what I remember from his debate with Phaser was that he talked about, well, look, if a being has an essence, then that already means that it exists, right? So then this whole idea um, uh, that I think that, uh, that Opie is hitting at is that he's rejecting this idea that existence is something that's kind of given to a being from the outside, right? So uh, existence is not a predicate and so forth. Well, what would you guys say in response to that? Well, I think Let me, uh, there's a, go ahead. <laughs> oh, I, I just think there's a couple of problems here. I think the first one is, I actually think that Opie would be very right if you start by interpreting the argument um, for um, the essence, the argument in Deante, uh, 
as proving the real distinction from the beginning. If you think the intellectus essentia argument proves a real distinction, if you think the stage two argument proves a real distinction, you're going to run into Opie's problem. Because at that level, um, maybe it's just essence. Maybe Aristotle's right. Maybe it's just essence that having an essence is enough to be. But if you take the argument all the way to its end, you say, okay, well, maybe this argument's Maybe stage one and stage two give me a logical distinction. Maybe they give me a real distinction. I don't know yet. But if you wait until you get to stage three, where you get to a being that is subsisting existence itself, now you know that existence exists as a real nature, as Owens would put it. And it's something in the real world that you have to have in order to be. And, and since there can't be more than one of these, then each one of these has to have this perfection in a certain way. Now, and this may be difficult to understand because this perfection, when it is had by us, is not a nature, it's an act but we can analogically use the language that we use to talk about nature to talk about this act analogically, but it's never going to be a perfect one-to-one -one with the language. The other problem is I don't think Opie um, has done enough investigation into Thomas's approach to this because I don't think he's examined what's called an essence under its absolute consideration. Um, an essence absolutely considered is what belongs to the essence in and of itself per se. And he, he notes that, you know, an essence in itself is open to either existing in the real world, right? Or existing in the mind. So it can have real being or conceptual being, real existence or conceptual existence. So the, this means that there has to be something that accounts for the conceptual essence versus the real essence. And what accounts for that is this act of existence. Again, we may not be able to define it because it's not formal, but it has to be there. Otherwise, at most, you have a conceptual essence. Now, of course, you'll never find the essence in it itself. You'll always have the, in your mind, you always have the essence plus conceptual existence, but you can abstractly say, okay, what would happen? Well, the essence in itself doesn't need either. It doesn't, isn't determined to either. So it has to have a real active existence to subsist in the real world. Right. So I think that one of the problems with uh, Opie's critique there is that he, uh, again, assumes or treats existence either as a second order predicate set of uh, like species rather than individuals, um, or he treats it as a categorical uh, accident, whereas, uh, I, again, I would say it's a pre-categorical accident. And so to reformulate something like the, uh, for, so for him, um, in order for something to be predicated of a thing, you would have to say something like the existing, that Christopher Apodaca exists would mean the existing Apodaca, Christopher Apodaca exists. It, so it's just a redundancy. Um, but what we're not doing as Thomas, we're, we're not doing that. We're not, we're not, we're not talking about, um, we're not using a tautology, we're talking about the e essence having an act of existence. What we're saying then, if we reinterpret it in kind of like analytic language, would you say, we would say that the existence neutral essence has an act of existence. Right, because it's open to both. It's, that's yeah, right, because it's in itself, both, yeah. the essence could either have cognitional being or real being. And we're right. saying, so in itself, it has neither. And I'm saying, but it is a fact that that um, in, in reality, right now, this essence actually has real being. Mm. And so we're, we're going beyond the, uh, the the facticity, the recognition of that. Yeah, it just, it just so happens to be the case right now that Christopher Alpadaka exists. At one point, he didn't exist, which is a really hard reality for me to fathom um, for a number of reasons. My, my life makes would be so much worse. It's, it makes yeah, it no, it non-redundant. Yeah, it does, right. Um, but then, uh, but it makes it, it makes it not redundant in the fact that he could not exist at some point, um, or doesn't necessarily have to exist. If you want to use like use talk about it in modal, modal terms, um, tells us that there's something about the nature of Christopher Apodaca, precisely considered in himself, that uh, abstracts both from cognitional being and from real being. Even though it's always going to be the case that you find him in one or the other, and that there isn't some Langonian slum to put use uh, uh, Gavin Kerr's words, um, wherein this neutral essence exists. But when we consider Christopher Apodaca precisely in himself, his essence is not something that necessarily entails mental existence or real existence, but he's neutral open to both, sometimes at the same time, because I understand Chris, even though he might not always understand himself sometimes, <laughs> um, but I also have that, my, my knowledge of Chris is precisely Chris, and that uh, essence, that, that, uh, that intelligible content exists both in my mind via, uh, but it's instantiated with a cognitional act of existence and in Chris himself, but with a real act of existence. Right. Um, so just, to, just to add to that, to all of that. Um, so, yeah. So, um, uh, Oppie's objection is an interesting objection, which is kind of a species of, you know, uh, the Kantian existence is not a real predicate kind of thing, as well as, uh, uh, 
um, it's not it's not an original objection to Oppie. It's actually one that's been more or less formulated in the same way by Anthony Kenny. Um, and so the objection, um, I remember this conversation uh, being had between Oppie and Edward Facer in a in a in a discussion uh, somewhere on the internet. But Oppie basically um, holds that existence just is part of the essence of a thing, given that it exists. So in other words, Oppie insists that uh, I have a quote here actually. There aren't any non-existent things. There aren't essences out there waiting to be joined to existence. And so Api thinks that these two points, right, taken together, show that existence cannot be, uh, you know, a, a, a real property of concrete individuals. Um, and so and by that, uh, I don't want to sound, to sound too blasphemous, but by that I just mean that uh, a real property being one whose presence or absence makes a real difference to the individual which has it. Uh, Anyway, Api is obviously right to say that there aren't any non-existent things, any essences out there waiting to be joined to existence. But it's, it's kind of difficult to see why he should take this to be of insight to the Thomist, right? Who, after all, agrees with him. So the Thomist, again, just to say it again, it's not a pla he's not a Platonist with respect to essences. Uh, but I, I would think is something of an imminent realist, according to whom... Uh, according to which there are no uninstantiated essences. Uh, there are no non-concrete essences is, is basically the contention of the Thomist. Uh, and so, so that aspect of Tommy, of, of Apis's objection, I'm, I'm not sure what role it actually plays in, in sort of our undermining the argument, right? Um, but Opie, Opie takes the fact that talk of essences is restricted to instantiated essences, right? To show that the existence of X just is part of the essence of X, right? And that is what Thomist would take to be false. Uh, just a quote from David Oderberg here, uh, quote, the nature of humans or of dinosaurs in the abstract cannot be identified with their existence, nor can their existence be any part of their abstract essence, since existence is precisely what actualizes an essence. And this is the crucial part. It is no part of the essence of anything that it exists. Rational animals, rational animals do not essentially exist, nor does anything with the atomic number 79, unquote. So uh, that would be one answer to Apis's problem. Another way of responding to Apis's objection, sort of in, in his own plain field and in terms of contemporary philosophy would be to say this. Um, what Apis seems to want to do is to basically try to reduce the concept of essence to modality, right? To talk of possibility and necessity. The problem with this kind of modal account of essences is that most contemporary philosophers reject it, adopting instead for a view of somebody like Kit Fine, uh, who argues in a famous paper now called Essence and Modality, that the essence of a thing is prior to, its possi to a thing's possibility or necessity. Uh, so in other words, uh, we're better to understand essences as being that which grounds the sorts of things that are logically, physically, or metaphysically possible or necessary for any given thing. Uh, but then we can clearly see that if some thing X were to actually exist, then its existence would have to be something independent from its essence. And that's because something being possible for X does not entail its actually being so. And so we still have a real distinction. Um, here's a third objection, and this is uh, one that's discussed by a contemporary philosopher uh, named William Balicella. So consider that Socrates might never have existed, okay? If we're prepared to hold uh, that existence is just part, okay, part of the essence of a thing, or that existence reduces to the nature of a thing, then we would have to say that for Socrates, who is a man, to exist just is to be a man, okay? But if Socrates might never have existed, then this would actually entail uh, the absurd conclusion that Socrates might never have been a man, okay? And so from this, it follows that Socrates' existence cannot be part of or reducible to Socrates' essence. And therefore, it, it shows that there has to be a real distinction between essence and existence in Socrates. And so the essence and existence distinction still holds. Wow, this is really great. Okay, so we're going, we're going a bit long, but that's okay. Um, let me just, close, let me just uh, ask two last questions and then we can wrap this up. So one question is, 
um, just they're, they're usually just general hesitations to classical theism that some people will just say, okay, look, this conclu the conclusion of this argument is the God of classical theism, uh, and especially uh, in particular, right, uh, divine simplicity. So some people will say, look, I just can't accept that. So this argument has to have gone wrong somewhere. That's one objection that I've seen some people raise. Um, maybe the argument leads to modal collapse, who knows? And then the other objection, or the other question that I have for you is, is there an actual objection that worries you, right? Is there an actual objection to the Dante that worries you or is, are, are you pretty confident in this argument or what are some reservations that you have or some questions that are left? Uh, I'll leave that to you guys. So one is, um, you know, somebody might not be totally okay with classical theism and what, I mean, are there any objections that worry you or any questions that linger? So I'll leave that to all of you to kind of address. Maybe I'll have Christopher go first and then we'll yeah, go to sure. Jonathan. So as far as the, um, as the problem of, 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 you know, classical theism making sense, um, especially with regard to the modal collapse, uh, the modal collapse is that God is um, pure, uh, pure actuality. He's a simple being with no parts. Then everything he does is a necessary, which means in all possible worlds, he doesn't have freedom to create the world that he, you know, he has to create the same world in all possible worlds, which means this world is in a sense necessary. He doesn't have free will. I think that the biggest problem with this argument is an underlying assumption. In, in us, in created and limited beings, for us to create different effects requires that we are, have act and potency, right? We have potency to do this effect or potency to that effect. We have different powers and, and properties. And, and um, so if I choose to lift weights, I'm gonna be different than if I didn't choose to lift weights. Or if I choose to study law, I'm different than if I had chose to study philosophy. And I think what happens is we take this assumption of, or this, this observation about what's true of cre uh, created limited beings who are not pure actuality. I think the modal collapse people take that and they try to project that onto God. So that if God created the world, or if he didn't create the world, somehow he would be different. Um, and therefore, um, we have to reject, um, we have to reject divine simplicity because if God's different, that I means it has potential to be one way or potential to be another way. But I think that's a mistake. And it's because God's causal power, if he's going to be pure actuality, as the argument concludes, and we're going to be mixes of act and potency, God's causal power is going to be completely different than our causal power. And so that if God creates one thing or creates another thing, it's going to entail no difference in him. Now, this may be hard for us to grasp or understand, but that's kind of the point, that God is infinitely beyond our level to, uh, of, of comprehension. And that when I predicate causality of God and I predicate causality of creatures, I have to do it in a logical fashion. I have to realize that my concept of causality in some way imitates God's causality, but I don't know how it imitates God's causality because it's, it's just so much different and so far beyond anything that I can conceive. And if I of how he can be free and still simple that's fine because god is infinitely beyond my intellectual conception one way to look at it is this god's freedom and his simplicity to create his simplicity are part of his are, are 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 his nature that's what his nature is now i can't comprehend his nature which means i can't comprehend his simplicity or his power his causal powers which means that even if simplicity and causal like a lack of potency in me would be would contradict my ability to be free in God they must exist in some other way some higher way that they don't result in a, con a contradiction I don't know what that higher way is because he's infinitely beyond my my intellectual comprehension but it must be the truth that that is the case that his free will and his simplicity exist in such a way that they don't conflict with one another I don't know what it is because I don't know his essence but it has to be the case that they're compatible in some way yeah, and just to, um, oh, sorry. I was just going to say really quick too, like um, if the general metaphysics of the argument holds up and the principles are true and the argument is sound and valid, right? Then, um, you know, it's not really up to us to provide that positive case, but just to d d uh, show negatively speaking, right? Like the objection doesn't go through, but then how precisely right. the mechanics work, you know, that burden isn't on us. I like the way you said that because I always say just because we don't understand the mechanics of how God, things work in God's um, operation, that doesn't mean that um, it's untrue. Um, like you said, the argument holds, it holds. I don't understand the mechanics, but that's because I have a limited intellect. And I can't, that's as far as I could go. And um, there's this great uh, Thomistic philosopher, Father Joseph Thomas White, who says, at this point, we just bow before the mystery because the argument holds. 
it leads us to a conclusion that we fully grasp, but we know it can still be workable because we say God's causality is different than ours and his free will is different than ours. And it, so they must be able to exist in a simple being in a way that that's, that's, there's something different about them that makes them compatible, but that's something different I don't understand. And we have to stop there because that's where the logic leads us. Right, um, that's, sorry about oh, go ahead. Oh, so I, that's right. Kind of piggyback up from some of what Chris has said is that there's a, a certain ordering that, an, 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 almost like an epistemological ordering, if you want to call it that, uh, that we have to follow when we're talking about God's attributes. First of all, we say, we can argue that he exists, that he's different than us, um, that uh, he's simple, that he is, uh, that he contains all perfections within himself, um, that he's united, there's only one of them, and so on and so forth. These are things that we can hold with, I think, you know, pretty strong certainty in terms of even maybe even how we understand it analogically speaking but as we kind of get further into the mystery of of god's like inner life we can't philosophically perceive what's going on because we don't have access to to, to what's going on in in god's inner life in the same way or in, in a way i guess similar that's i don't know exactly know what's going on in your head right now um but uh, it's even uh even more pronounced in god who's infinitely beyond our um our our, our grasp and just like what uh, what the Joseph uh, Father uh, Thomas Joseph White says, there there comes a point where we recognize that there's there's certain realities and there's a tension between the realities that we don't quite fully grasp, like how they how they work. But again, the argument works. Um, we we can say that both things are true. We just don't know how they are. We we, we can't account for their um, both subsisting in God according to our creaturely understanding. Um, but we can say that they're, uh, however they do happen to uh, subsist in God, um, they must do so in a way that's, uh, that's coherent because of the other, because of the pre prior uh, things we just, we've established about God being simple or whatever. Um, and uh, to also respond a bit to Mullen's objection that the God of classical theism, even if we, um, you know, discard all the different uh, objections to it, is in itself incomprehensible, I say, great so what um that's kind of the point i mean isn't that a biblical thing oh your, your thoughts are so far beyond our thoughts uh your ways yeah. are beyond our ways and like every single major confession has the incomprehensibility of god as a as a as a necessary de fide point of doctrine um and furthermore simply because we don't have a full understanding or full comprehension of something doesn't mean we don't have any full uh, any comprehension or under, understanding of it um a partial understanding or partial comprehension is still comprehension of some truth um even if it's not uh an all-encompassing one i think jonathan it's that statement that um if you claim to be able to understand how all of god's everything that's going on inside of god if you claim to be able you're not thinking about god anymore you're thinking about something else you're thinking about a demiurge right. yeah right yeah just to kind of repeat what's been said already um uh the project of classical theism is not the project of perfect being theology right where you start with certain theoretical stipulations, right? And then you try to figure out how those make sense of the nature of God, right? Classical theism is the conclusion of a number of philosophical arguments, okay? And so we have to keep the order of priority in perspective, right? Uh, uh, any antinomies or any, any, any sort of puzzling questions that may arise as a consequence of having shown, logically shown, or deductively shown um, that that there's a being that is pure actuality, that is uh, a being in whose essence and existence uh, are identical, a being that is uh, 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 metaphysically simple and so on. Um, you know, we just kind of have to, you know, put on our big boy pants and work at it. But it's not, those things do not in themselves posit a refutation of classical theism. Rather, they're more like invitations to clarify uh, things about the nature of God insofar as we can, right? Uh, and so just, uh, just to add to uh, Swan's uh, uh, question as far as, you know, what are some objections that worry you with respect to this argument? Um, I, don't have some, I don't have really objections that worry me now, or I should say I don't have objections that I find fatal at this, at this point uh, of my studying this argument. But I would say that there's some objections that at least I think had had much force than than I think they do now are things like, for example, the Kantian claim that existence is not a predicate. Uh, something like uh, the objection that uh, that Abi uh, develops, which you know originates with Anthony Kenny, uh, and similar objections to the effect that 
uh, existence is only you know a second order predicate. Uh, so with respect to both of those, I mean, I think the central Thomas response is is perfectly satisfactory to me. You know, and that's just mainly to say that there has to first be something before predications of any kind could be made, right? And so existence has to be a real feature of things, without which there would be no things about about which to make you know predications. Uh, and so it, if anybody wants to kind of dig deeper into those kinds of Kantian objections and Oppie's objections and so on, I would point readers to uh, uh, William Balicella's work, uh, his book, A Paradigm Theory, Theory of Existence, uh, Onto Theology Vindicated. Uh, and if anybody wants a deeper treatment of kind of, you know, overall contemporary objections to treating existence as a first order predicate or as a real property of concrete individuals, I would point people to uh, uh, to Gavin Kerr's uh, work, Aquinas' Way to God. So it's a good book. Yeah, it's a good book. I think I think a lot of those um, objections are also grounded in the distinction of uh, in the in that logic. Um, analytic philosophers tend to be working in the realm of logic rather than metaphysics. Um, so they're treating all properties as the same kind of thing. And in metaphysics, yes. we we work. Uh, you know, we're, we use analogical predication. And so, um, you know, existence isn't going to be the same kind of predicate as, say, um, uh, you know, um, redness is a predicate. And so they see, well, existence is just a predicate like redness. And if you treat it like a predicate like redness, you get all these problems. But the mm -hmm. Thomists say, no, 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 no. Existence is not the same kind of predicate of redness. It's a very different kind of predicate of redness. We predicated of things very differently. And so we don't run into those same kinds of problems. I also think that um, for me, I don't have a big problem with this argument per se. I, um, I think that the, the, the greatest objection that I run into personally, I think for most people, it's, the, it's a significant objection is the problem of evil. I think it is the, by far the most challenging objection, natural theological arguments for the existence of God, um, because it can be laid out in such a way that it seems to imply a contradiction between an infinite God who is good um, um, now, you know, it's, it's compatible if you understand the existence of good and why God would allow privations of the good and, and to exist for the sake of the good of the whole and, and all of those things. That's totally um, coherent and rational to me. But I think that a lot of um, people who are dabbing their toes into philosophy are probably more deeply influenced by continental philosophy than they realize they are. Um, what is it? The Closing of the American Mind by Bloom? Is a good is a really great book that expresses that clearly how deeply how deeply we're influenced by continental, especially existentialist philosophy, and if that's your intellectual bent and you're wallowing in uh, French nihilism or something, um, you come to this problem. You see evil in the world, and it doesn't matter how many of these philosophical arguments you show to give to show that. Um, that this evil in the world is not a not a, a deal breaker. In fact, it, you know it's quite compatible with the existence of an infinitely good God. Um, but on that, but the, the, that that existentialist philosophy might be in your guts. That it's hard for you to see past it. You're like you look at your own suffering in your world, your own suffering. You look at the extreme suffering of children and sometimes something like that. And on an existential level, you're all, you're so horrified that you're like, well, I just can't see how a good God allow these things. And that might stop someone from getting to the point where they consider these kinds of arguments for the existence of God. I remember being at a party one time and this guy was like, well, what did you, you know, this is back when I had just finished my master's thesis. He's like, what did you do your master's thesis on? It was the essence existence distinction. And you know, it was relating to proving the existence of God. And he's like, what do you mean? You can't, like he was like physically angry almost, you could tell when I told him what my thesis was about. You can't prove the existence of God. You can't prove the existence of God. If you can't do it right now, do it right now. How do you explain all the evil in the world? Clearly, he wasn't ready to have that kind of conversation. I mean, he was just acting out of his, his anger and his existentialism and, and all those things. And he wasn't prepared to hear a rational um, treatment of these issues. Right. And with, when it comes to the, the problem of evil, it's not so much that the problem of evil disproves the, the, the conclusion of the Deante argument or the, even the existence of an infinitely good God. It's just that we have these two obvious these two realities both of which are arrived through different means arrived through different means you know these the, the existence of god through the day reasoning which is at the end of the height of metaphysics um and then the problem of evil from our everyday experience um and from reflection on that and so there, there are these two facts about the way the world actually is and it's just trying to understand why how is it they're both compatible not that how is it is one true and is, is the other false or, or or some such thing but we have these two truths how do we make them click together.
Um, and that's a different topic for a different day. Uh, I also think Chris said something interesting about how if we treat um, existence as a first order predicate of things, it leads to all sorts of uh, absurd conclusions on the um, kind of Fregean model of, um, of, 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 of uh, predication, which is primarily about more like logic rather than about metaphysics. So it, it operates on unidifical predication rather than analogical predication. But the very fact that that, that model of trying to understand the world entails such absurdities um, or at least such absurdities from, from predicating that a thing exists kind of, at least in my opinion, should give us an indication that the system itself is flawed. Um, because clearly things exist. Um, even like uh, if you're using existence on the second order, uh, as a second order predicate, um, in order to say that, uh, there, uh, that cats exist means that uh, insofar as X is a cat that there is one, uh, you would have to say, uh, uh, and then you can say cats exist, um, but in order to say that of a species, of a, of a, uh, of a universal, that has to be true of in individuals first, because a species can only exist as far as individuals exist. And so the individual existence is actually more fundamental and primary than, uh, than the, uh, the species existence, mm -hmm. the existence of the species. Um, for me, I think it's somewhat similar to Chris's concern with the Dante argument. It's not so much that the, uh, it's not so much the metaphysics that are involved, um, but uh, partly some of the Thomistic controversies that are, uh, that, that, that rage about, you know, wh which, at which point, at which stage does the Dante reasoning lead to the real distinction? And do you have to incorporate sense input and like, can, like uh, contingency and necess necessity or um, things going in and coming out of being or degrees of existence, whatnot. Um, but the, uh, and so th those sorts of things kind of concern me a little bit, but that's more of like on a professional level. Um, like having an argument with Gavin Kerr about when the real distinction occurs, you know, as a, as yeah, a, he's great, but he's wrong. No. <laughs> he's great, he's wrong. Um, it, it's, it's probably going to be best resolved by, uh, by us having a Brazilian Jiu Jitsu match at some point. Um, but, uh, uh, the, the deeper issue for me in terms of using these arguments is that trying to express them to somebody who has absolutely no understanding of of metaphysics has yeah. no understanding of the existence of God where for them um, the, the closest thing that you can get to a good argument would be something like the Kalan cosmological argument. As somebody I worked in youth ministry for like six or seven years. Um, there was a day when I had no prep and I was in the middle of studying the Deante argument and that night's topic just so happened to be arguments for God's existence and for whatever reason I decided to opt for using the Deante argument. Um, <laughs> Great job. Was, <laughs> rookie awesome. mistake. Um, <laughs> your rookie mistake in the last year you were in youth ministry. I was just, I was just so burnt out. I didn't care anymore. Um, you know, about, about half the kids got it after a little bit of explanations and questions. The other kids are like, what? Um, and that's because there's just like, well, th this is the difficulty of explaining to mystic metaphysics in general is that there is so much baggage that we have either through certain habits of thinking like image or picture thinking um, or by conceiving of cause and effect as uh, a correlation of events um, or uh, what constitutes a proof or constitutes a proof or people think but, that, that only empirical proof constitutes a proof sometimes and they don't even realize that they think that right and they don't even realize that such a thing is not based on any empirical premises it's just kind of asserted through other philosophical uh, so philosophical reflections or or like that uh, like form and matter aren't distinct ray. They're not two, dis two separate things, but they're two principles. And they're not like form of matter pushed together and they're still sort of like physically distinct from each other. That's not how it works in Thomism. And so there's a lot of like, there's a lot of habits, there's a lot of terms, a lot of ways of thinking um, that are, that, that need to be overcome before you can really articulate this argument in a, in an apologetic sense. Well, let me just say thank you to everybody for being involved in this conversation. I had a great time. Uh, just thank you for unpacking the day and day and talking to the audience. And I hope you guys had a great time. Um, do you guys want to say anything before we go? Or are you are you satisfied? All right. Well, I'm good. I, I, my intellectual curiosity will never be satisfied. Okay, that's not entirely true. Um, I don't know. I had to say something. Um, but no, that was great. Thanks, Swan. I uh, really appreciate you inviting us on. I'm really glad that we got Christopher on. Uh, for those of you who have not heard of Christopher Apodaca, you are missing out. Um, he is, I think, he's going to shake his head at me because it's totally embarrassing to him. Uh, I think he is probably, uh, out of every Thomas philosopher I know, one of the least appreciated because he doesn't get out and actually like do his philosophy in public. 
but he is fantastic. I highly well, recommend thank you. And, and, and my my having him more on my enemy, stuff. So. He is, he's a wonderful man, a great philosopher. So well, Jonathan's I, pretty uh, great himself, see. actually. Jonathan and I actually have grown a lot All together. All right, guys, you, you can take this off screen, you know, but you know, <laughs> I'm just kidding. It's okay. I'm not in the room, guys. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just go check out all these guys, check out all their work. They're all brilliant thinkers. Thank you so much.